Welcome to Our Cats Detailed, a show where we uncover lessons learned to help you navigate your next project. My name is Sharice Lakeside, Senior Spec Writer at RDH Building Science, and your host. If you're a current listener, thanks for joining me here on YouTube. If you're new to the show, we have over 60 podcast episodes that you can catch up on on your preferred podcast app or at www.arcat.com slash podcast. In this inaugural episode for YouTube, my guest is Mark Husser, managing partner at Grimshaw in New York with offices also in Los Angeles, London, Paris, Dubai, Melbourne, Sydney, and Auckland. Mark's work focuses on the application of environmental design technologies on building projects where energy, materials, and resource consumption are key design drivers. His architectural approach involves applying the highest level of available technology to improve the social and environmental effectiveness of buildings. As an active member of the design industry, he is a frequent guest critic and lecturer at several schools of architecture and has been a guest presenter at various sustainable design symposia. The project we're going to chat about today is the Newark Liberty International Airport Terminal A in, you guessed it, Newark, New Jersey. Replacing aging and outdated airport infrastructure, the new Newark Terminal A boasts modern check-in and security screening technology, as well as an abundance of retail, restaurants, and lounges, providing a seamless and comfortable traveling experience. Let's get into the details. Mark, welcome to Detail. How are you today? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, I'm thrilled to have you. I'm excited to talk about this project. Are you in New York today? I am. I'm actually in upstate New York today. Um, uh, ironically, because of canceled flights, um, I couldn't do my usual trip to Houston. So I am in New York. Ah, yeah. The, the, the airports are a just a tad bit of a hot mess right now. Um, I usually, the last two years, I have traveled during this week to Boston to see my son. And um, we're doing it a little later this year. And so I'm really happy I'm not in an airport right now. <laughs> me too, me too. We like to start off the podcast with an icebreaker just to, you know, get us comfortable. And since we are chatting about an, an airport today, an airport I happen to have been in, um, in my travels, I was naturally thinking about travel um, when I was trying to think of my icebreaker, icebreaker question for you. So my question for you is, what is a dream location anywhere in the world that you would like to visit and why? Well, I would take that to be a place I haven't visited before. Right. I mean, as working on airports and many projects globally, we, we do um, travel a lot, but I hadn't been to Croatia. And, and in fact, I'm uh, going there this summer um, because I haven't been there. We'd love to see, you know, the cities of Croatia, but also the coastline. And I'll be sailing around the coast of Croatia, which we understand is some of the most beautiful coastline in the world. So very excited about that for sure. Ah, uh, I don't, I, number one, I've heard it's a beautiful country. Number two, I'm totally dripping with jealousy right now. That sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so we already in the intro read your official bio. So briefly, tell me a little bit about Mark, the human being. What are your passions in this life? Well, that's a pretty big question. Uh, but I would say, you know, we really do want to be making buildings and environments and spaces and master plans that uh, truly do make a positive impact on the communities that use them. So, you know, I've always been driven by the work uh, that we do. And, um, and that is probably the primary passion outside of, you know, my two uh, lovely sons who I've had a great deal of uh, enjoyment in raising. Um, but, um, but yeah, I would say that, um, um, really doing meaningful work that contributes back, um, and makes a positive impact on communities environment. Uh, and then personally, I'm an avid sailor and an avid skier. Uh, so every opportunity to do those two things is also very welcome. Sounds like some things that can help keep you out of trouble. 
So, <laughs> or get you into trouble, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, Sometimes. Yeah. This will be my second, actually, airport project interview um, since we started the podcast. And one thing that I, I seem to be discovering about airport projects, which is probably one of the few types of projects I haven't worked on in my career, um, is they have a lot of really super unique requirements, which also from the project description sounds like it's the case at Newark. Before we get into specific project details, tell me the story of what drove this project into being. What, what's the background? What was the need? Right. Well, you know, as you probably know, um, New York metropolitan area is the, is the busiest airspace uh, on the planet Earth, and um, it's only getting busier. Um, all three major airports are projecting, you know, very significant passenger numbers, um, you know, up to 2050 and beyond, uh, which is going to require a great deal more capacity in in the air traffic and the um, uh, in the air side of airports, as well as in the terminal facilities. And a lot of those facilities are very antiquated. Uh, you know, Newark was built in the early 70s, so it's over 50 years old. Um, airplanes were very different than the number of passengers uh, were very different than. Uh, so this project actually began, gosh, uh, we were involved since 2008, originally with an entirely different team, um, doing a plan for a new Terminal A at Newark. Um, at that time, it was um, going to be a 45-gate international terminal. Um, uh, by the time we finished that program, there just wasn't that much uh, money in the coffers, and it, it turned into a uh, primarily a domestic terminal. Uh, you, what's happening in many of the airports is, you know, the space is constrained. So as the, as the desire and the, and the need increases, what tends to happen is the um, airports uh, tend to upgauge aircraft which increases capacity. Um, and so, you know, the air side, nor a lot of the, the, um, uh, the terminal facilities were adequate to accommodate uh, the future growth. So that's really what led to it. And the Port Authority, you know, has been uh, pursuing this program for quite some time. Um, and then we were, uh, it went through three iterations of procurement. Um, um, after we were involved in 2008, we actually did the sustainable airport of the future, how to make a sustainable airport, uh, given all of the demands um, that an airport has. Um, uh, and then it went through a separate procurement process where another team worked on it for three or four years. And then yet another one where it was worked on for three or four years. Uh, and then finally, um, it came out uh, in 2017 as a design build procurement, uh, at which point we teamed with a construction consortium uh, to pursue the project. Interesting. I did, I did not expect you to say that just now. Just... Well, the, these projects have, uh, you know, they, we are sort of like when the music stops, you know, they go through several iterations around the chairs because uh, there's such huge investments uh, for, um, for the authorities that run them and for, you know, the communities they serve. Uh, and they take a, a very long time to get done. I, I really would not have, I'm going right down a rabbit hole. I really would not have expected it to be a design build project delivery method. though. So I find that really interesting on a project of that size. I mean, we see a ton of design building little projects, but I don't think That's I've right. ever heard that on a, on a project this massive. Well, and this is the largest design build um, uh, project um, in in New Jersey history, uh, apparently. So I was told after the opening by the governor. Um, but it, um, yeah, it's it's a but design build is becoming the the sort of procurement uh, method of of choice by many um, by many client groups. I mean, design build has been used for a very long time uh, for large, uh, sort of highway infrastructure type projects or bridges and those kinds of things, but not so much for public facilities. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's really changed a great deal. And did that work well? Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, in terms of the product, um, for the cost, um, it was a, a great success. Yeah. And also the schedule and bear in mind that this actually was built during the COVID period. So there were some 
setbacks because of COVID. Uh, but it was a very aggressive schedule um, and a very prescribed uh, budget that was, you know, was essentially a hard build design, a hard bid design build. Um, so I think from the client's perspective, it was very successful. Um, there are different forms of design build, as you know, there's progressive design build um, and different sort of levels of risk thresholds for the various parties that are there and different places in the country and in the world, in fact, uh, use kind of different forms of procurement. In Europe, uh, a lot of the infrastructure projects that we do are, um, are more like a progressive design build where we would have been engaged to some degree and gotten so far down the design and then ultimately novated to a construction consortium uh, and then sit under their contract for the delivery. Uh, so there are different methods of, you know, different types of structures uh, for this, but it is a, um, a method that uh, owners are, are seeing more value in, or I would say more predictability. I'm, I'm hearing a ton from my guests about aggressive schedules, um, really pushing innovative ideas in, in both methods of construction and delivery methods. I'm hearing that over and over again. It's, it's kind of surprised me. I think I feel like I've been in a little bubble that I've been missing that piece. Um, people yeah. are getting really creative about how they're getting building buildings done in a lot shorter period of time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it does. And that is a genuine interest in this case of the Port Authority to bring, um, you know, sort of um, public, you know, private sector knowledge into the public building uh, industry and, and bring those uh, lessons. How can you get it done faster? How can you get it done more effectively and maintain quality? Um, and it forces, uh, you know, different ways of thinking about traditional roles. And we tend to work a lot more with trade contractors um, in a uh, sort of design assist or, um, wow. you know, you're basically <laughs> designing around, yeah, yeah, designing around existing conditions, you know, going into a, a new building project. But so it forces a sl slightly different way of working. Well, I'm sure you've got lots of lessons learned from that. Um, let's, let's talk about Terminal A. Let's start with a broad description of uh, what... What does, you know, what does Terminal A look like? What's in this space? What kinds of things did you have to design for this terminal to meet the Port Authority's needs? Well, you, you know, so part of the story starts with the history of Newark Airport with the three existing terminals that were done there in the early 70s, which are, you know, very heavy um, in situ concrete construction. Actually, I have a huge appreciation for those uh, buildings, uh, very aspirational uh, at the time they were done and have served, you know, the community uh, and the airport very well. Um, but, you know, the industry has changed, the aircraft has changed, you know, the need for, um, you know, higher floor to floor heights and the baggage handling systems are a lot more sophisticated. Um, and uh, security, obviously, after 9-11 is entirely different than it was in this country before that. Uh, so security drives a, a great deal of the terminal design. Um, but the aspiration was to have a modern terminal that is, um, you know, world class in the sense of um, passenger wayfinding, passenger processing, passenger experience, uh, with all of the amenities that you find in, in contemporary airports around the world. Um, you know, because we were the early adopters of, um, you know, commercial aviation um, in this country, we built all of our infrastructure much earlier than much of the rest of the world. Um, and so now uh, other places in the world, mainly Asia, Middle East and so forth, have brand new gleaming, you know, airport terminals, uh, lots of retail and entertainment and uh, lots of amenities. And, uh, um, uh, and ours are kind of, you know, antiquated. Uh, and so there is a kind of a huge modernization that's going on across the country uh, because all of our buildings are kind of reaching a point where they're no longer uh, effective. Um, and they certainly aren't imbued with all of those qualities. So uh, the aspirations were that, you know, to create a great passenger experience, a really clear wayfinding, you know, light, bright, open environments, things that are sort of, you know, architecturally stimulating uh, and powerful. Uh, that speak to the aspirations of the community, 
and also offer a lot of those kind of softer touch amenities, lots of local art, local food and culture embedded into the experience, you know, because part of it, you know, these buildings uh, can be very anonymous. Uh, and I would say in the old days, uh, they were seen more as a piece of infrastructure uh, than a piece of um, uh, sort of civic architecture or, you know, something that was driven by more of a hospitality attitude. Uh, and what we're seeing in, in airport design is that, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot more creature comfort and hospitality focus in terms of the choices of food and beverage or uh, different types of amenities or, you know, children's play areas or interactive zones or um, the integration of art and, uh, and branding or three-dimensional media uh, in the passenger experience. Um, so all of those things were, um, you know, aspirations from the beginning and, um, and ultimately, you know, embedded in the, in the terminal project. So we're really happy with the result there and under a design build type of procurement, which, you know, came with its challenges. Airports really, I mean, obviously I've been around a while. Um, airports really are changing the Portland airport. I live in Portland, Oregon. And our airport here has been going through massive work for years now. Um, and I remember the first time I worked in one of our newer terminals. It's not the newest one, but, um, and I'm like, is that a movie theater? There's a movie theater in our airport, you know, and, and restaurants and bars and shopping and, and just, you know, it was, it was nothing before. I remember flying in and out of that airport as a child. Um, and it was just basically go wait at your gate and get on a plane. Um, but, but I love it. And it makes sense. I mean, especially with all it the people getting I mean, stuck at the airports. <laughs> it's a wonder we took so long to learn that lesson. I mean, it did kind of take, I think, other, um, you know, later evolution of, of airport infrastructure in other parts of the world to learn just how important they are. You know, Schiphol Airport was probably one of the early ones to really start implementing um I would say alternative uh, amenities into the airport experience. Um, and Schiphol's very interesting. You know, they do 70 million passengers there and it's a, it's a small country. Uh, they actually, you know, it's, it's a 70% transfer airport, but it brings enormous uh, revenue and accessibility to their businesses globally. Um, you can actually fly from Schiphol to more airports in the UK than you can from any other UK airport. Uh, and it's largely because they were, um, you know, early adopters. I would say pioneers in in really enhancing the passenger experience there. But you see it um, in airports across the world, in in Korea at Incheon, or in at Hamad in Qatar, or in Dubai, um, where you know the airports are developed almost with a, a sense of nationalist uh, pride, um, and they are loaded with amenities um, and um, and they're sources of kind of uh, inspiration uh, for for their, you know, they're, they're almost like, you know, some of them are obviously have the advantage of having sovereign funds that build them um, uh, where they can sort of invest uh, perhaps a lot more than we can, which are more commercially driven. But um, but there has been a sea change in the way that we think about that from having the, you know, small grab and go coffee shop to having lots of food and beverage choices, having, as you say, lots of amenities uh, for people to take advantage of. But when you have, in this case, for instance, we have 13.6 million passengers a year that we've designed for, that's a lot of captured audience. Um, and so um, I think the commercial side of people who run airports have gotten a lot more sophisticated to understand the value of that as well. Well, and, and captured is... Um... I love that you use that word because that's kind of an understatement. I mean, when you're in an airport, you're in an airport. You're not going anywhere. Especially when you're post security, right? Yeah. yeah. And 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 oftentimes you're you're waiting, you know, especially if you have longer layovers or a flight gets canceled or whatever. And I don't know about the rest of the world, but I get bored really easy just sitting there, you know. So and, and it is the first look anybody's gonna have visiting your city or your country, or it's the first thing they're going to see when they get off the plane if they've never been there before. And so I, I certainly can see wanting Absolutely. to make a better impression. 
Right. They're, they're, they have, a, as I say, kind of an ambassadorial role for the cities that they serve. You know, it's the, it's the, the, the first place that you encounter and the last place that you leave from. Um, and so and that means that, you know, both of those journeys um, are very important to think about. You know, what is the perception of an arriving person here, perhaps for the first time? Um, but also, what is the perception and experience of someone who's departing from here um, um, and going away? So on one hand, you have the excitement of the journey. Um, and then, you know, on the other hand, you have the uh, sort of, you know, the sense of arrival but for some could be the, the excitement of a new place that they're coming to. So you have both those things happening, both in the um, arrivals and the departure sequences. So we do a thing called journey mapping where we um, um, try, you know, we think about every possible passenger type that there is and then uh, look at physically every step in the journey, um, every moment of transaction or transition from the perspective of each of those uh, individual passenger types and then say, how can we make this better for that passenger, right? So you've got business passengers, you've got families, uh, holiday passengers, you've got uh, elderly people with reduced mobility. Um, so we're sort of going through the rigor of sort of saying, okay, how does this moment impact that passenger and how can we make it better? Um, you know, or things that we do to try and make sure that we're covering you know, all the possible users and constituencies. And then when it comes to the retail and, and food and beverage program as well, what are the range of services and, and uh, amenities that we should be offering from children to older people to pets? You know, and, and I'm sitting here thinking, watching, you know, I've lived here all my life, so I've watched our airport change from this nondescript just thing that you get in and out of town through to this, the relationship art, the carpet in our airport has its own Twitter account and, and it makes fun of your feet and people take pictures of their feet on the Portland airport carpet before they leave. And it's a whole thing that there are these crazy ways that that community engagement and um, kind of ownership and pride happen that I, I don't think people even realize they're doing half the time. That's right. But yeah. There are pictures on Twitter of my feet on the Portland airport carpet. <laughs> so I, I can promise it does change the relationship. So reading through your right. project description, um, one thing that I thought was kind of interesting, and this intrigued me also because of um, something I read the other day somewhere. Um, it sounds like there was a lot of high tech security equipment that was a part of this design. And I, I know we're not going to talk details about security, but, um, and then I, I read this thing the other day, I think it was in China, the security guards have these special glasses that they just walk around and look at people and within seconds a computer can gauge whether that person is wanted by the law anywhere. It, it was really, you know, security's gotten really crazy at airports. Are there consultants for this kind of specialized equipment to help you you know, I think about on the architecture side, working with all the consultants and having to design a building like this that has so much of that kind of equipment. How do you, how do you navigate all of that? Uh, yes, there's no shortage of consultants. Um, <laughs> you know, it does take a village. Um, and, and that is, you know, half the challenge, uh, or at least a significant part of the challenge is the coordination effort of all those different, um, you know, disciplines uh, into a, you know, a holistic uh, building project. But yeah, there are um, AV, IT security consultants, uh, consultants who deal specifically with security equipment. Um, there's the air side operations consultants and loading bridges and, um, uh, you know, the, the, there's just no, no end. Uh, it's a huge industry and there are, uh, you know, true expertise out there and all of those things. So part of the, the role, you know, that we have is to, um, coordinate and, and direct, um, those, you know, consultants into, you know, a singular kind of solution. Uh, but yes, it, and the chain, the technology has changed very, very quickly in security. I mean, you remember the pre nine 11 days where you could arrive at an airport 15 minutes before your flight and walk straight through onto your gate. And there was, uh, you could have, you know, non-ticketed passengers on the, you know, going down the concourse with you and those kinds of things. Um, 
but now obviously security um, is is much more important um, and and particularly now um, touchless um, security and the use of uh, biometric type uh, security systems retinal scanning and so forth um, you know sort of you know clean and secure type technologies lots of different scanning type of equipment uh, there as well and you know part of the challenge has always been you know how do you do that effectively um, um, uh, expeditiously and as um, and as uninvasive as possible uh, and so technology is evolving very quickly to make that um, you know uh, better and better I think there's still a ways uh, to go in terms of improvement uh, but that's also you know one of the I would say one of the most high stress moments of the passenger experience uh, where you where passengers tend to experience the most anxiety um, um, in you know maybe you go check in and ticketing is one thing but uh, going through security uh, we try and make it as comfortable as possible uh, as spacious as possible as understandable in terms of um, where you're going uh, next and how the process works um, um, and then uh, the, what we call a sort of recomposure uh, period, uh, making sure that when you come out of security, you have um, an immediate understanding of where you're going next, um, and also some degree of comfort that you're near your gate. So having a view over the next environment that you're about to encounter, where you can survey it, and also having views to the air side where you see gates and airplanes makes you feel a little bit more comfortable to, you know, spend some time enjoying the other amenities that are now being provided uh, in the terminal. Yeah, it's funny story. Years ago, I went with another mom to visit our boys at uh, the National Jamboree for Boy Scouts in Washington, D.C. And as we were leaving through security, um, my friend all of a sudden was being surrounded by the airport police and federal marshals. And I had no idea what was going on. Well, apparently when we uh, went to the army base and all the 50,000 scouts were staying on to see our boys, her son had asked, can you take home some of my souvenirs? You know, and we're in civil war era, you know, history. Um, well, he had, he had bought this old, old, replica of this old civil war era gun it was plugged even in the um you know it was meant to be a decoration it was it was not a gun that could shoot he threw all this stuff in her bag and she never looked to see what was in there that was a really talk about adding stress to getting through security <laughs> so and that so was contraband yes yeah <laughs> and that was one month before 9-11 mm -hmm. i've always wondered wow what would have happened had had that same thing happened after, but um, yeah, I, I I am very careful about Amazing. everything in security after that experience. She was the one going For getting sure. in trouble, not me. But so tell me yeah, about it can be daunting. Yeah, tell me about some of the more unique parts of this design that were incorporated into this project in, in Terminal A. What if I were to walk through there? What's the what are the unique things I'm going to see in you know, what was, where did you get to be a little creative with the design? Well, I think, you know, starting <clears throat> with the overall concept for the design, you know, we felt that um, this wanted to be a, a very modern, contemporary, forward-looking, uh, progressive terminal, uh, both in its function, but also in its architectural expression. But at the same time, you know, it sits, um, alongside for the foreseeable future with the three other terminals that are newer from the mid-century, you know, from 1970s and so forth on. And so we wanted it to relate. Uh, so it still be, be, behaves as a part of a family of, uh, of terminal uh, projects. It doesn't feel completely novel or foreign, uh, but does, does set a trajectory for the future. Um, and, you know, from a material perspective, um, using materials that uh, perhaps le have less, um, you know, carbon uh, implications of so not, we didn't use uh, reinforced concrete, we used, um, you know, steel and other materials, natural woods and so forth. So from that perspective, you know, some of the features there are the sort of extreme overhangs or cantilevers that cover the departures curb. 
and the departures walkway, making sure you know there's a, a level of service there, keeping people dry. Um, and uh, you know, New Jersey weather can be quite uh, challenging at times. And also being very expressive in in terms of the way the roof uh, extends out way beyond the, the curtilage of the interior environment. Uh, and then when you go in, I would say the most distinguished quality of the terminal throughout is the natural light. You know, the other terminals are really quite dark, very heavy, opaque. Uh, and so we had this concept to have a lot of skylights that bring in natural light, but filtered through another ceiling layer, a layer of louvers essentially that sort of reflect and refract the light into the space very evenly, but uh, at the same time allow some direct light to hit the floor so that you can get a get a sense of the, the time of day and the passage of the sun, and but also this great sort of ambient light feeling. You know, very generous, lofty space and ticketing so that from the moment you enter, you understand the room, you understand the hall, how it's laid out where the ticketing counters are and exactly where security is uh, without ever having to look at a sign or, or, um, or ask anyone. Um, and then um, moving straight into security with very efficient um, um, ASLs or automated security lanes, uh, which are much faster. Um, and then moving into the recomposure area with a great view over the food beverage retail area. And, and views to the to the air side. Um, I'd say the other thing that we've tried to do is soften the material. So as I talked about journey mapping, you know, wherever there's a moment of, I call it transaction or transition, is a, is a sort of a stress inflection in the passenger experience. So in those locations, we try and introduce uh, sort of more natural materials, organic materials, biophilia, uh, those kinds of things. So you'll see the use of natural wood um, and, you know, lighter tone wood. It sort of, um, uh, sort of, um, sort of reduces in a way uh, that and planting can reduce stress uh, in the passenger. Uh, so we in incorporate those types of materials wherever those, those moments um, uh, of, of transition. Um, and then I would say in the, in the air side, um, you know, Again, embedding the experience with lots of local amenities. There's a huge interest in making this airport, um, or this airport terminal, uh, really representative of Newark and not just New York and the region, right. uh, but specifically to highlight things that um, are specific to uh, to Newark um, and and even locally in Newark. So, our um, the operator, uh, Munich Airport Group, who were uh, selected to operate the terminal were also very interested in this. Uh, and so they were able to get a lot of local chefs and a lot of, a lot of local cuisine uh, into the airport instead of a, a single kind of uh, provider where the food and offerings become fairly generic and, and even the retail. Um, uh, a lot of it comes from local retailers and so forth. Uh, so making it local. Um, the other thing that we did was um, look at you know, the sort of overriding themes about in New Jersey. So this concept of fantastic first, most people don't realize a lot of things happen for the first time in New Jersey. <laughs> uh, the light bulb, um, you know, Edison studio and, you know, all of these early uh, inventions. Uh, and so we actually um, use that as a theme. We brought in a group called Moment Factory, who actually came in under Munich um, with, you know, with uh, some of our, suggestions to, to engage in using digital um, uh, art um, to enhance the experience and even interactively uh, to develop content um, for the terminal. Uh, so actually, while you're waiting in security line for uh, to go through security, there's a large, um, essentially digital billboard, which has content about the history of New Jersey or, or certain unique aspects of New Jersey that's a you know it's sort of entertaining to watch while you're waiting in line in the queue, uh, and then when you come out into the large retail hall, there's the uh, the forest of firsts, which is a digital story of all of the kind of first inventions uh, in New Jersey. 
And, you know, so part of it is to support New Jersey and say, oh, you know, there's some really interesting things in New Jersey I wasn't aware of. Um, uh, and then there was a huge uh, local artist program as well, where, you know, commissioned pieces of art are integrated throughout the, the, the terminal. Uh, and then one of the things that we did as well is looked at, um, you know, how can we add a little bit of, um, of that aspect um, of New Jersey, but also make it a little bit uh, playful. So in the restrooms, for instance, um, as you go from the center of the terminal out to the piers, and there are three piers or concourses, uh, there are different um, uh, toilet rooms, and each of them has a different theme uh, based around four themes. Um, there you go from community to Jersey Shore or the coastline to um, the woodlands, the pine barrens, uh, and different aspects of New Jersey with a lot of photography. And, the, and that photography is actually lined uh, inside of the toilet stalls. Oh, wow. So you don't see it until you open the toilet stall and then there's the, a whole sort of mural around you uh, that's related to one of those themes. Uh, so that there's a bit of variety. If you're flying it through the airport, uh, you'll have a slightly different experience each time uh, you go, if you go to a different part of the terminal. I, I love that. What are, I'm curious, because this is one thing that's always been a pet peeve for me in, in I'm going in a rabbit hole again, um, in airports is, you know, you get there, you go to your gate, if you're not going to a restaurant or a store or whatever, and you've got these hard plastic chairs to sit in, or it's just a lot of the gate waiting areas are not, but I, I do see this starting to change, but they're not tremendously comfortable. Like our airport down the actual big long hallways or whatever you call them in an airport to get to the gates. They have big easy chairs. And I saw another airport that had rocking chairs all over the place. Um, what is, what did you guys do with your waiting areas? This is just a personal, totally. I want to know question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, there is a lot of uh, progress. As I mentioned, there are lots of different passenger types and, you know, you have single business travelers by themselves or with a group, or you have families with small children uh, so, you know, one shoe doesn't fit all. And in a traditional airport, yes, you had rows of uh, Eames chairs, you know, right. the beam seats, you know, that are sitting there, if you were lucky to have an Eames chair. Um, uh, and, um, and you know, that's very efficient for, you know, the minimum amount of space required to pack the most people in. Uh, but again, it's, it's not the most comfortable. It doesn't suit everyone. Um, and it's not necessarily a good way to spend the time. Um, so in contemporary airports, you know, usually the hold rooms uh, are now employing lots of different types of seating. And it's what we did at Newark as well. And this is, again, ultimately delivered by, um, by the operator in this case. But uh, we helped them certainly conceptualize um, how that seating could be arranged. So we have um, everything from some of those traditional type of seats, all be these very comfortable um, and then we have mushroom chairs, we have um, chaise lounges, which are sort of communal. Um, uh, we have uh, individual sort of uh, soft uh, ball seats that kids can kind of sit on. Um, and so there are a lot of different variety in the way that the, that the seating is done so that people can occupy it in the way that they want to, rather than being forced into a particular way of being uh, or sitting. Uh, in a, what we call a hold room or where you're waiting for your airplane, um, uh, a waiting room. So that does have a space um, requirement. Uh, so it takes a slightly more uh, area to be able to accomplish that. But it's a, it's a much better passenger experience. I, I didn't realize it the first couple of times I went through our new terminal where I saw the big easy chairs down the new terminal. Until my last trip, just just recently, I went to San Francisco to the AIA convention. And I'm walking through; they actually fold down flat. You mean the AIA convention? Yeah, isn't that what I said? <laughs> you said the AA oh, convention. No, the AIA. I just did not enunciate. <laughs> um, no, I did not go to the AA convention. I, I don't anticipate that anytime soon. But these easy chairs folded flat. They, the back would fold down and you could flip up a, a footrest. And I actually saw somebody sleeping on one. And I'm like, thank you. You know, um, just, you know, when people get, I got stuck in Chicago overnight once. So they ended up putting me in, up in a very not so nice hotel. Um, 
but having an option like that for people that are, you know, they have a six hour layover or whatever. I just thought that was a really beautiful touch. I had no idea it was there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you, you, we do have a lot of that type of seating, um, as I said, much more reclined type seating, uh, in the terminal. Um, and you know, what you said about, you know, having a, a you know, delayed flight or something like that, you know, that's a really important consideration as well that um, you really have to think about what we call the ROPs or the irregular operations situations where like we're experiencing just over the last few days where you have a huge amount of canceled flights, a lot more people in the terminal than you would normally have, uh, you know, happens here with snowstorms and everything else is what do you do? You know, how do you, um, you know, service that uh, group or that community in that situation? Um, so having more variety, having more space, knowing and having a plan for how you're going to deal with the ir- irregular operations is, is a, an important part of the design as well. I love that they're um, thinking about all of those things. Um, well, so we love talking about challenges or and problem solving. I don't like to call them problems. I say that all the time in the podcast. I don't call them problems. Every project has challenges. Um, you know, how are we going to make this work? How are we going to make this fit? What can we do unique to make this happen? Um, what were some of the more challenging things you encountered on this project, design or construction? Um, and how did you work through those things? Yeah, I would say um, probably the most challenging things I alluded to earlier was um, a, you know, the design build um, form of procurement that we had on this project. Um, was, you know, I guess would be called in the industry hard bid design build versus progressive design build. Um, And, you know, it was a very protracted uh, competition stage uh, where we're, you know, doing design proposals and working with the contractor and working with the owner to get feedback and then ultimately leads to a, a, um, you know, a a submission and, um, and a winning team. Once that happens, there's an extremely aggressive, uh, you know, design and construction schedule. In this case, I think it was originally 39 months uh, for a 1 million square foot, you know, $1.5 billion terminal. Um, And so it was, it's extremely aggressive. And so the challenge is, uh, as I said earlier, the steel was procured very early on. And so there was, uh, under a normal design sequence, you know, you would have, you know, you do concept design, then you have schematic design, you would have the ability to massage all the systems and, you know, all of those various things that have to work their way in mechanical, electrical, structural, with structural baggage handling systems, which are extremely complex, um, to kind of adjust as you go, then you go into design development and then you start maybe procuring and after contract documents. This is uh, that's out of the window. So you're you're working almost in fixed constraints from the day from the first moment. Uh, So that can be very challenging um, uh, from a coordination point of view. Um, But it also is, um, you know, I think you just we, we, we just have to change our mindset and say these elements are fixed. So what would you do if you were working in an existing building and it were, you know, it was taken down to structure, but you couldn't change the structure? Um, you know, how would you solve that problem? Uh, and so that sort of becomes the mindset for how you, uh, how you progress, um, you know, the, the work. And the other thing I would say is, um, you know, what I would say is a lot of the work is sort of, um, has to be procured slightly out of sequence. Uh, so out of sequence with a normal design process. Um, and so that's something that, you know, presents challenges and coordination with things, um, um, where, uh, you might've, um, procured, um, you know, say your, um, your, your backup system for your curtain wall, uh, yeah. but you actually haven't resolved the exact curtain wall configuration at this stage or really, uh, resolve the loading, um, of the curtain wall between, you know, blast loading, wind loading or, or whatever it may be. Yeah. And so you're having to make, uh, adjustments. Um, after things have been uh, procured with those um, trade contractors, uh, but it's 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 not um, uh, as you say it's not a negative thing. It's just a different way of working. I love that you said when we first started talking about that. You said 
it's not necessarily a bad thing. You just have to change your mindset. Um, I think with the progression of technology in our industry, and again, I've been around, you know, with where the first computer I ever saw in my office was from Radio Shack. Um, Commodore. <laughs> no, it was a Tandy. But, uh, oh, Tandy. Yeah. Okay. It, but I think with so much emerging technology in our industry that's moving so fast, we, we have a difficult time these days ever having a quote-unquote pencils-down moment. And when you have something like you've ordered the steel and now you have to make everything work around what you've already got, that almost forces, I think, some of that thoughtful decision-making that we had when they were still draw drawing on mylar, you know, we we have to really make this decision because, you know, it was a completely different animal putting together a set of documents, especially in a project this size. Um, and so, and so I just love that you said, change your mindset. This is not a bad thing. Just how can you look at it in a way that, you know, that's more positive and more collaborative to making it work. Absolutely. So, Mark, I believe we learn and grow from every project we do and take that wisdom to the next project. So looking back on your journey through the Newark Terminal A project, what would you do differently on the next airport project as a result of something you learned from this one? Uh, it's a really good Really good question, Teresa. I think um, um, these are, you know, very large projects. They take a huge amount of people, uh, a lot of coordination. Um, I think on this one, uh, the biggest lesson was the need to collaborate um, even earlier with all the stakeholders that are going to be engaged. You know, you you have. Um, you know, lots of interested parties. You have the airport, you have the airlines who are actually going to be using it. You have the passengers, um, but you have also from the construction point of view, you have the, the contractor and all their subcontractors, uh, but then you have the layer of the operations team. In this case, it's Munich. Um, and then with them, you know, came all of the retail and food and beverage uh, program. Uh, and then you have the advertising contracts, you know, so you have all these different, um, you know, stakeholders that get engaged uh, in the process at one time or another. I think the, the biggest lesson uh, for me on this one is is having those stakeholders um, engage much earlier in the design process uh, and in the construction process um, so that you can um, integrate, you know, you know, everything they're doing on the retail food and beverage and, you know, sort of fit outside into the base construction. Um, and uh, that's something that sort of it was it was later in the process, and so there was a lot of uh, another thing. You know, had to be a lot another of, thing I'm hearing from a lot of guests. Right. Yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so having it integrated so that it, you know you're constructing at one time, and not uh, having to go back and retrofit a lot of things. I love that, Mark. Thank you so much for joining us today on Detailed. I wish. Oftentimes in these interviews, I had hours to ask all the questions I'd like to ask, but I appreciate you sharing your time with us today and telling me about this great new Terminal A at Newark, and I will have to make sure I have a flight through there so I can come check it out. <laughs>